Okay, hello and welcome to Q's first virtual event, our logline workshop with Laura Brennan of Pitching Perfectly. I've worked on pitches with Laura for various clients and for my own scripts, and I'm so excited to have her here because I think Laura's the best kept secret in Hollywood, and we don't want to keep her a secret any longer. So now's your chance to get to know her and see her in action. Laura, to kick off the webinar, I wanted to ask you the question, why is it that people can write an entire screenplay, one that's compelling and layered and a good read, yet they can't figure out how to nail just a one to two sentence log line? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> and it's largely because it's a completely different skill set. Well, actually, there are two reasons. One is that it's a completely different skill set, right? right. Um, you're you're trying to uh, you're trying to condense everything into you know into just a sentence or possibly two sentences, and um, you know it's not it it's not something that actually they teach you when they teach you how to write a script. The other reason is you're actually too close to the, your script often mm -hmm. to um, to be able to to figure it out. Everything seems important to you, right? Everything seems juicy, and right. that. Um, actually comes from a misunderstanding of what a log line is supposed to accomplish, um, yeah. which is what I'm like, the first thing I'm going to talk about. That's something that I'm guilty of, which is you can, when you get in front of someone and it's finally your chance to tell them your log line, you can just over explain and that's just too much. Right. Um, and it's not selling what you have. And so I think what, what I use you for, which is like, you pull it back and say, well, why did you love this project in the first place? What moves you about this project? And you're kind of like, oh, I forgot. I've been working on it so long and it's been, you know, hours and years that you just forget, you know, some of these key questions to ask yourself when you're doing the log line. Right. The thing is we come to it with, um, like we come to it when we're, when we're trying to give someone a log line. Well, there's a couple of things. One is that we come to it with the backstory of the whole thing in our heads. Right. We have all the context in the world they have none, okay? Yeah. They have no context. And so what we forget to do is we forget that human brain, or, or we don't realize, right? That human brains are, um, are really, uh, um, well, brilliant, but also really specific. We need to hear things. We need to hear them in a certain order mm -hmm. so that we're not confused. We tend to confuse right. fairly easily. Um, so like my my friends, um, one of the ways I, int I introduce myself um, it's not in terms of necessarily having a log line, but just in terms of a log line for myself is I used to tell people, look, my friends call me the goddess of pitching, which is lovely and very flattering and almost true. <laughs> very true, I think. Yes. <laughs> ah, but truly I am the goddess of structure. Mm -hmm. I am good at pitching because pitching is a highly structured conversation. Yes. As long as you get the goddess part right, I'm you can call me anything, right? <laughs> but that's really the key. And I think that that's the thing that we don't think about too much when we think about the log line. Um, and it makes it so much harder to write one because we think we're gonna have to pull it out of thin air mm -hmm. when in fact, it's a very highly structured conversation, right? When right. You, you'll see, um, when, I, when I showed up on the board, I, I came prepared with pictures, right? It really looks like Mad Libs mm -hmm. where you have these questions that you need to answer and then you plug them in, in order. Mm -hmm. And what it does is, is it artful? No, it's not gonna give you an artful answer, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna give you all the information that someone needs to hear in the correct order for them to be able to then actually hear what it is you're saying about your piece so they can make the determination if it's right for them or not. Right. right? And if you, if you skip any of those bits, if you don't give them a title, they don't have a box to put the information in. Mm -hmm. If you don't tell them the genre, they don't know what they're listening for. Um, right, and, and it throws so, it all off. And it yeah. throws it all off, right? They can be, if in their head, they expect you to be pitching a comedy and you're pitching a thriller or a horror film, mm -hmm. those things can actually sound the same mm -hmm. right up to the punchline. Right? <laughs> So I, one of the stories I like to tell is that there are actually multiple versions of um, of the multi-sound thing. You, 
my Maltese Falcon back there, right? I love the Maltese Falcon. And almost everybody has seen the, um, the Humphrey Bogart version, right? Mm -hmm. With Mary Astor. The Humphrey Bogart version is a thriller, right? It is film noir. Right. But about five years earlier, there was a comedy version of it with Betty Davis. It's the exact same story with the exact same ending. Mm -hmm. And they shot it as a romantic comedy. Doesn't work. But it doesn't mean that it that the same story can't be pitched and made mm -hmm. either way. You have to tell them what it is that you're going for for them to be able to hear you in the correct way. Yes. All right. Well, I'm I'm good. And it looks like we've slowed down the number of people coming in. So if you want me to like launch into my PowerPoint. Perfect. Okay, let me I'm go gonna... ahead and share screen. All right. So um, let me hide myself. We all right. Log lines, Laura Brennan. That's me. So um, uh, I'm going to start actually by giving everybody the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> if you get nothing else out of this presentation, I mean, I hope you get a lot out of it. But if you get nothing else out of this presentation, this is the thing that will change your life, right? When you are pitching, and that includes giving a log line and an elevator pitch, which I'll talk about in a minute. When you are pitching, we think we're selling, right? We think that we're like a used car salesman and nothing could be further from the truth. You are never selling when you're pitching. No one is, you're never gonna go up to someone and pitch your idea and have them write you a check. Like that actually isn't how it works. So what are you doing? If you're not selling, what are you doing? You are presenting your box of toys. That's all you're doing. You're just showing them what you brought today that's fun to play with and seeing whether or not they played with you. And in fact, this, this metaphor holds up in that most actual pitches, right? So most times that you're going in and actually pitching your projects um, really are, are finding that Venn diagram. It's a conversation of what, what you offer and what they need. Now note that it's not what they like. It's what they need. They may like a lot of things, but they have money to make this specific thing over here. That's what they're looking for. And so what happens is you come in and you, you pitch and you're like, well, look what I brought today. Slinkies, right? They're like, oh, slinkies, slinkies. We've got 18,000 slinkies. Um, Play-Doh? You're like, oh, Play-Doh, Play-Doh, Play-Doh. Legos? And they're like, Legos! And then you start talking about Legos, right? That is essentially what you're doing when you're going to pitch. You're just showing them what you brought. And then they're countering with what they need and you're finding that Venn diagram. So the elevator pitch, what I call an elevator pitch, and lots of people have lots of different definitions, but this is a good working definition. The elevator pitch consists of two separate pieces. It consists of a log line and then what I call the tell me more. So the log line, is that thing you start with. It's what we think of as the pitch, right? The log line is that one sentence. Sometimes it's two sentences. I'll get into that in a minute, but it's usually one sentence for a feature. Um, that, and its entire job is to ascertain whether they're interested or not. And that's it. That's the entire job of the log line. You're not selling, you're just showing what's in the toy box. And then if they're interested, then they'll literally say something like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more, which is why I call it the tell me more, right? But they'll, they'll do something that shows interest. And we'll get to that in a minute or half an hour. Um, okay, so let's hit the log line first. Your log line is the most important piece in your arsenal, not just because it is the easiest thing for you to share with people. You can share it in emails. You can share it in conversations. You'll share it in th at Thanksgiving with your family. Like it's the thing that lets people know what you're up to but it's also your true north as you're writing. I am a big believer in coming up with your log line before you write the script because your log line will tell you where you need to go. And you're, the clearer your log line, the clearer your path in terms of writing your script. So what does the log line look like? Well, first of all, let me tell you what it's not. The log line gives a sense of the story. Tagline is the poster. This is a thing, something that people get confused about all the time. Your log line needs to give context. The tagline comes with context. So what do I mean? Um, in space, no one can hear you scream, right? By itself, without the poster, that's not a log line. 
it needs the context of this poster. What kind of context does the poster give? It gives tone, right? It gives the title alien. It gives, a, and it's clearly for a movie, right? It gives context to the tagline in space, no one can hear you scream. It's a great tagline, but it's not gonna ever be the first thing out of your mouth. Same with this next movie, um, Tango Shalom. This is actually uh, produced and, and the woman um, playing the dancer in it is one of the producers, she's a friend of mine. And this did, you know, this is great little movie, did very well it can. Um, following your dreams can be rather unorthodox. By itself, that doesn't really work. It doesn't tell me anything about the movie. With the context that the poster gives me, it's kind of great, right? <laughs> like it gives the feel of it, it gives the flavor of it. Like the but the poster does all the a lot of that heavy lifting. Also gives me the title, which I'm gonna you know hit on again later. So don't confuse the tagline with the log line. Two different things. Um, the log line should make the project clear. That's really the only thing. It's not, yes, you want it to have, I'm never gonna say you want boring things to come out of your mouth. Uh, you know, you don't, but you do want them to be clear. You want it to be crystal clear what it is because the only job is to separate, oh, separate, hmm, I apparently have accidentally moved a slide. Should be a slide that <laughs> separates people from those who want it from those who don't. I'm sure the slide will show up somewhere else. Okay. So um, that's what it does. It, it separates the people who are interested in this project from people who are not interested, right? Because you're not selling. You're never selling. Michael Bay will never make Pride and Prejudice. Never going to happen. But it says nothing about Michael Bay's projects and it says nothing about Pride and Prejudice. It's just not a good match. You are looking for something that's a good match because that is what, um, th those are the people you wanna to talk to. If someone, it's not a good match. They only do, um, they only do quirky comedies and you've got a uh, dark comedy, which actually this happened to a friend of mine who's a producer. She was doing quirky comedies and somebody came at her with a dark comedy and it just wasn't a good fit. Didn't matter how good the script itself was. She didn't have the money to make it. She had her funding in place for very quirky sort of British comedies. And that's what she made right? Nothing. It's just, you're, you're wasting everybody's time. You can't convince someone to make something they don't have the money to make or the inclination, right? All right. So that's why you're not selling. You're just presenting. So creating a log line, how are we going to actually do this? First, this is the, this is the Mad Libs part. And I do actually have a, um, I have this as a worksheet, which we're going to send you a link to. I'm going to, I'll put the link in the chat and then also, um, uh, well, I'll say it out loud because for people who are watching the, the replay of this, you can find it on my website, pitchingperfectly.com. Look on the top and find worksheets and it's going to be living there. Okay, so Mad Libs. What's the medium, right? What is it? Is it a screenplay? Is it a short? Is it a web series? Is it a TV series? Like there's so many things it could be. I work with people who are novelists. Is it a novel? Is it a memoir? Um, what's the medium? You have to say that first. And then you say the title. Why? Because the title gives them a box to keep the information in. And if you don't give them a title, they'll create their own box in their head, which, you know, if you're at a cocktail party, could be, you know, a woman in the blue uh, dress. Right? <laughs> That's not actually the box you want. You want the box to be the title. Genre. Again, you want them to know what they're listening for. Are they listening for the funny? Are they listening for the scares? What are they listening for? And then now they're prepared. Now they're ready to hear you about a main character who, and then the single most important thing about the story, right? Single most important thing they need to know. Um, and is death, right? One thing, single most important thing. And is death because they actually lose focus. When you say and, you're going off on a new tangent, they need to create a new synapse, right? They need to create a new network in their brain for it, and you will lose people. They will forget the beginning because you keep going on. Okay, log line. Here's what it looks like. My blank, my screenplay, uh, turtles above all, 
is a a uh, buddy comedy about a mutant ninja turtle who uh, I'm making this up on the spot, obviously, or, or about a um, about a young man who about a and young man actually isn't good enough. It's sort of about a, a um, uh, disgruntled accountant. That's better. About a disgruntled accountant who befriends uh, a an actual living mutant ninja turtle. There you go. Okay, is that artful? No. <laughs> But you know what it is? It's refinable, right? Just like I refined young man to disgruntled accountant, right? That which tells me so much more about the character. Right? I, you never kind of want to go with just man or woman or young or old or whatever, right? You want to go with something that actually gives us something in the character. You want to refine this once you have it. And then you just want to test it out on people. And what you're looking for when you test it out on your friends, right? Go to your friends, say, you know, meet them for coffee and outdoors <laughs> or in the after times and you know you, you say hey i'm working on this log line for my project can i run it by you i really appreciate your um your feedback and um which is not untrue right their feedback is way less important in terms of what they say to you than it is when you're watching them what you're watching for is do they their eyes glaze over we misunderstand what that means eyes glazing over does not mean you bored them Eyes glazing over means that you have lost them. You have confused them. You have said something that's hard to hear or doesn't quite make sense. Their brain takes an extra three or four seconds to compute that and they miss the next five to six words that you've said, right? That's what eyes glazing over means. If you're in the headlights, means you've given them too much personal information and they do not know how to process that, right? So be careful if you're something that's based on your own life. You want to be careful of the overshare. People can't necessarily process it emotionally. You'll get a deer in the headlights reaction. You can't overcome that. Eyes glazed over, you can totally overcome that. You just want to kind of catch them up. There you go. I hadn't planned to talk to you about that, but since I mentioned it, I might as well go all the way. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> Again, this is just to separate people who want it from people who are just, it's not their cup of tea or they don't currently make that, whatever, they don't have the money for it or it's just not their cup of tea. That's it. So what do you do if it's not their cup of tea, right? If it's not their cup of tea, if they say no for any reason, if they're like, oh, that sounds really great, but you know what, it's just not my cup of tea or, you know, we, oh, yeah, we got 18 of those. I don't, you know, but, um, you know, what else you got or something or, or they just say no, right? For whatever reason they say no, you come back with, what are you looking for? Oh, what are you looking for? What are you looking for will change your life. What are you looking for lets them off the hook for not wanting what you brought. But it also gives you incredibly good advice, right? incredibly good information. Um, because you might have that. You're writers, you have more than one thing. You may very well have the what they're looking for. Also, your best friend may have it, right? This happens to me all the time. I am always going, I, it may just happen to me in the last week, right? Where someone was looking for something and I was like, oh my gosh. And I have a friend who I know has that and I, I hook them up <laughs> because it's a win-win. It's a win for everybody. Producer's happy because they got the script they wanted. My friend is happy because she got her script to a producer. You know, whether they make it or not, that's but the connection's been made. And um, I'm happy because both of them love me now, right? Like it's just, it's a win all around. All right, so that happens all the time, but it doesn't happen if you don't say, oh, what are you looking for? And they will tell you because they're looking for it, right? And then you become someone who can help them out. Okay, all right, I'm gonna stop share and I'm going to work with, um, I'm gonna work with somebody. Oh, I'm a little too close to that, aren't I? All right, um, I'm gonna work with somebody. And uh, let's start um, uh, with, with- oh, So we're doing Peter first. Right, fantastic. Okay. I'm gonna work with Peter. Okay, perfect. So I am going to introduce Peter. Peter Forbes is a graduate of our film school, School of the Arts. He previously won a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for a short film he wrote and directed. And the project Peter is going to be workshopping just last week won the Ezra Litwak Award at the Columbia University Film Festival, which is the top screenwriting award in the MFA film program. So 
big congrats to you, Peter, for that um, acknowledgement. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the magic Laura's gonna work on your log line. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so- I'm excited. Well, what I'd love is I'd love for you to just give me your log line right now. Yeah. So go ahead if, uh, and I'll say, so tell me, you know, like, what are you working on? Yeah. So I, I'm actually uh, just finished a project that won uh, uh, a top screenwriting prize um, at my film program. It's uh, called Dream Kingdom. It's a feature uh, sci-fi coming of age um, with some fantasy elements. And it's about a quirky fantasy obsessed teenager who joins a ther therapy group of lucid dreamers. Uh, and when they're, uh, what first seems fun, um, dreaming actually becomes much more serious when their dreams and reality start to collide. Okay. All right. Great. So, um, so I'm just going to play with it, right? I'm going to be wrong yeah. a lot. We don't mind, right? Through that, we're going to get to something good. Okay. So my first thought is that it's, um, it is that it's a little wordy. Um, in words that don't necessarily connect. So part of it is sci-fi is, is a realm where you need to be even clearer because I have no context at all going in. And it's, and it's kind of a sci-fi fantasy type of thing. So even worse, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> like in terms of what I can bring, what I as a listener can bring to the table. Um, I had real trouble hearing, and it might be because of Zoom, hearing your title. What is your oh, title? Okay. Dream Kingdom. Dream Kingdom. Okay, Dream Kingdom. Okay, so you might just want to hit that a little harder. So, um, uh, so, all right. So you're one. This is one of those cases where I think two sentences, one of them being very short, is going to be useful to you because you definitely okay. want to put in that it just won an award at a film festival. The problem, what you, the problem is that you know you kind of smush that down a little bit by saying within your in your film program. No, it won an mm -hmm. award at a film festival, right? Okay. So that that's that's great, right? So it's a screenplay um, that just won a festival award, right? Okay. Um, so my screenplay. Um, so I'm you know you can say I'm excited or you can just say so my screenplay. Dream Kingdom, I want to hear it right up front. My screenplay, Dream Kingdom, is normally I would only give you one, which is coming of age story. Yeah. But because it's so much, it's so important that we set up sci-fi, you get two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So my screenplay, Dream Kingdom, is a sci-fi coming of age story that that actually just won a top award at a film festival this past week, right? Mm -hmm. Or this past month, right? Or actually just, just won a top award at a film festival or just won a festival award, right? Yeah. Um, so you say screenplay up front so they know it's not a movie. Okay. Right, it's not a movie yet, it's a screenplay. So my screenplay, mm -hmm. Dream Kingdom, um, is a sci-fi coming of age story that actually just took in top honors at a, at a festival. Um, so it's super exciting. Yeah. Period. Right. That's why you get okay. that second sentence, because we're going to sneak in that. Why? Because people will hear you differently mm. if they're given the context that this is something somebody else already likes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. A snap of right? approval. <laughs> yeah. They love yeah. that. And that's good. We're going to use that. Right. It, it, it gives it a um, it, it juices it up a little bit. Right. And so then period. And so then you're going to say it's about a and this is where we're going to have to get to the get to the some a little bit more of the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about your main character. Yeah, uh, my main character is a lonely kid who stays at home with his mother. Um, he's new to town, he's wanting to make connection, but um, he has a really hard time doing that, partly because his mother is like very controlling because she's jealous of his time, um, because she's still grieving the loss of his father from six years ago. He's 14 years old. Oh, um, 14 is so important to say. Yeah. Because okay. young guy can mean 14, it can mean 23. Right, 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 right. Right? Okay. So mm -hmm. how about something along the lines of, um, uh, it's, about a, it's about a lonely 14-year-old um, really being smothered 
um, uh, um, uh, I don't, I want to use mother, but I don't want to use mother and smothered. Um, Mm -hmm. it's a, about a, a lonely 14 year old who's, whose whole life is his mother, his, you know, a small town and this, this sense of claustrophobia, Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 whose whole life is just, is, is, um, I want to uh, subsumed, but that's a horrible word because it's just hard, to, hard to hear. Um, yeah. so it's about a lonely 14 year old who, you know, who, who is he trying to break free of her? Um, he, no, not, not at first. He doesn't realize that he's in that situation until later. Okay. It's about a lonely 14 year old who, who doesn't even realize, that's good. Who doesn't even realize how much his, um, his controlling mother is keeping his life small mm-hmm. until he, um, he joins a group. Uh, it, now, all right, so a group of lucid dreamers. Yeah. Right? So it's a group, is it within a, is it just like randomly he looked up lucid dreamers in the newspaper? Like how did, <laughs> no, where did he, they come from? He has a meet cute with the girl at a mall and then he follows her and he finds that she's in a therapy group that's using lucid dreaming technology to help people uh, sort of wake up in their dreams and have choices. So um, he is able to join this because he's still grieving his dad? Uh, yeah, and his dad was actually one of the inventors of this tech, which he doesn't realize until later. That's okay, that's too much information. We don't okay. want that, right? Um, uh, so it's about a, a lonely 14 um, year old who doesn't even realize how much his mother is his controlling mother is keeping his life small until mm-hmm. um, until he meets a girl. <laughs> until he meets a girl who introduces him to a a therapy group that uses lucid dreaming. Suddenly, his life is everything he could dream of. Mm-hmm. But and now we want what we don't want is reality and dreams collide because they don't know what that looks like. What we want is a sense of danger and tension here. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right now he can have everything he dreams of. Yeah. So his, okay. What? Um, his, so his, there are two things that happen. One, his mother, when he, she realizes that he meets this therapist who's running the group, has a huge grudge against the therapist because she feels like she was complicit in her husband's death. So she forbids him from joining. So he joins it covertly uh, behind her back. It's like the first bad thing he's ever done in his life. And then in his dreams, because he's a fantasy obsessed kid, he creates this, this uh, kingdom that he's ruling, but he makes a mistake where he releases this, um, the dark one, and it takes away some of his agency in the dream to actually make his decisions. Uh, so he's facing an imminent um battle uh later on that then ties that um ties together with his own psychological block with his mother and his father's death and i can see the glazed eyes look on your face right now so i'm just trying to figure out well a little bit so we're going to lose entirely the first bit about the mom not being like that does not belong it belongs totally here's the thing spoiler alert you're going to get to say more Okay. In the tell me more part. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you can't say it now. Yeah. It's too confusing and it's not what I need to know. Look at it this way. All I need to hear is whether or not is, is are the things that are going to make me make it or not make like it's sure. my wheelhouse or it's not my wheelhouse. Yeah. What I need is I need to know what the what the real stakes are. So yeah. what I'm actually hearing is not sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Like what I'm really like, if the monster from his dreams is released into the world, that's yeah. sci-fi, but it's mm. not, it stays in his head. Right. Well, the, yeah, the characters halfway through are able to be in each other's dreams. Um, so I think that's the sci-fi part that comes in, but I, um, I think I hear what you're saying about it doesn't. Well, right. But so, so the thing, so I, I'm not trying to dissuade you from keeping sci-fi, although you might want to think it through. Um, mm-hmm. But, but the idea is, I really want to know, like, what's the bad thing that can happen? Yeah. Is the bad thing that can happen, he could die in his dream? Is that the bad thing? Is the bad thing that the, the demon he creates in his dream is unleashed upon the world? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the bad, what is the end, like, what's the bad thing? 
Yeah. Uh, the bad thing uh, in this is that he will get so sucked into the dream that he'll never embrace life. And he'll just like cut off. That's beautiful. Else. What you just said, that's beautiful. All right. Okay. So what did so, I say? <laughs> he gets so sucked in. So suddenly, and luckily this is recorded. You can watch it again. But um, so we have, uh, uh, and, you know, so he, you know, he, 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 he meets a girl who introduces him to a, a, um, a group therapy that uses lucid dreams, right? A group that uses lucid dreams in their therapy. And, um, and now suddenly his life is everything he can dream of mm -hmm. until, you know, un you know, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, he, everything he can dream of, um, but uh, everything he can dream of, but he, you know, everything he can dream of and he can't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. In fact, he gets so lost in his dreams that he forget that he loses the will to embrace life, right? Something like that, mm -hmm. right? And now I get a little bit of chills, which is what you want, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I can see, I can see the, what you're trying to show is like what the challenge of the movie is for the character. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the challenge of the movie is this life that's so much clearer than, you know, dreams versus reality. Yeah. Cause I don't know, like that could literally look like a monster attacking. Sure. 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 You know, New York city. Yeah. Right. But instead it's, um, uh, and suddenly he can have everything he dreams of so much so that he no longer wants to embrace life. Mm -hmm. Right. He just wants to let, he just wants people to let him be lost in his dreams. Oh, comp now I can see it's a complex coming of age story. I would, with that, I would lose sci-fi mm. because the sci-fi element is the lucid dreaming, which you are explaining. Mm -hmm. Right. So okay. I don't really need that. I just need that. It's a coming of age story. Okay. Do you see? Right. And Cause you're expecting like a big thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and if there's no more sci-fi beyond the lucid dreaming, which can be enhanced by technology, I have no problem with that. But if it's, if, if sci-fi really implies that there are going to be monsters and ships and like, and phasers. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so yeah. I would take that out. I would just have it be a coming of age story. Okay. All right. I would at least consider that. Okay. How's that feel? Thank you. Um, super helpful. Great. Fantastic. All right. Let's bring on Ricardo. Okay. So next up is Ricardo Acuna, who is also a graduate of School of the Arts. His scripts have been recognized in various festivals, and most recently, Ricardo was a 2019 Grand Prize winner for the Latino Screenwriting Competition. Woohoo! Hi, Laura. <laughs> hey, Ricardo. All right, so go ahead and, and um, give me your logline. Okay. Um, my screenplay, How I Wanted to Be a Preppy White Boy, is a coming-of-age story about a dirt poor Latino teenager who earns a full scholarship to an elite WASP boarding school and must prove himself in order to get into Harvard and get the girl of his dreams. Okay, great. So a couple things. One is, um, I love your title, How I Wanted to Be a Preppy White Boy. Okay. But that's not really a coming of age story title. It's a comedy okay. title, right? Mm. Is this actually a comedy? Uh, I'd call it a dramedy. So I that don't That is know. better. I would call okay. it a dramedy. Let's not call it a coming of age story. Let's call it a dramedy. Gotcha. All right. My screenplay, How I Wanted to Be a Preppy White Boy, is a dramedy about a teenage. Now, um, uh, you give me a lot of things about him. Teenage mm -hmm. Mexican-American. What was the other thing? Uh, dirt poor. Dirt poor. Okay, so I, I don't like dirt poor. I'd like to know like what he is like. I actually, I think Mexican, I, 
I like Mexican American. Okay. Like he's a um, because within the context of the title, like mm-hmm. it really pops. Gotcha. It's about a teenage Mexican American um, uh, uh, boy who um, and and um, like what does he do? What does he do when we see him at the very beginning? Mm-hmm. He's dirt poor, but is he doing something? Like, is he? Is he? Um, He's nerdy. Nerdy. Oh my yes. gosh, that's exactly what I was going for. Okay, okay. that's better, right? Okay. Right is about a um, is about a uh, a teenage Mexican American um, nerd. You know, mm-hmm. nerd. Right is about a right. nerdy is about a, a nerdy teenage Mexican American boy. Got a okay. nerdy teenage. Uh, in fact, we don't need teenage if we have nerdy and boy, right? That Got kind it. of. It's about a nerdy Mexican American boy who, and then what happens to him? Uh, he earns a a scholarship. Okay, wins is a little bit more active. Wins. Can we say yep. he wins a scholarship? You got it. Who right. wins a scholarship to this elite, um, to this elite prep school? Mm-hmm. Um, and then instead of giving me. And what do you give me next? I, I remember Harvard uh, and the girl. Yes. So he he wins uh, the scholarship to an elite prep school uh, right. in order uh, and must prove himself. OK, so this is the bit. Mm-hmm. The actual what you're giving me is you're giving me the kind of goal at the end. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. When this when Harvard uh, and as a Yaley, I protest, but that's OK. When Harvard, <laughs> when uh, when the girl. What I really want to hear is what the proof himself is. I want to hear what the actual driving force, hmm. right? And not what the prize is at the end. So how okay. does he prove himself? Uh, by being able to compete academically with, with the other students. Really? <laughs> Well, I'm just um, thinking, like, I don't know. I, I didn't go to a boarding school, um, mm-hmm. but I, I, I certainly in my high school, like, people were not, it wasn't about the academics <laughs> necessarily that made right. you top dog, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So does he, like, prove himself sounds like there's a loyalty thing going on or, or prove himself wor- like there's a racism thing going on? Mm-hmm. Like what is, is yeah. what are we, what, what, what's like, he's a smart kid. He won the scholarship. Right. So I go in thinking he's a smart kid. He can take them on academically. Right. Right. Um, uh, he, he, I was thinking about how he had, he has to, um, I mean, so basically what I mean by prove himself in in terms of the story is, you know, uh, um, adapt to the culture, assimilate, you know, um, uh, be able to compete again. But I mean, ultimately he's doing it because he feels like this is a way to help his family uh, out of poverty in some way, shape or form. Is there a possibility that he's losing his sense of self in trying to sort of assimilate to this? Absolutely. I think that's so much more interesting, right? Right. Right. Right? It's a dramedy about a nerdy Mexican American teenager who, nerdy Mm -hmm. Mexican American uh, guy, boy, whatever you decide to use there, Mm -hmm. um, nerdy Mexican American boy who wins a scholarship to an elite um, uh, boarding school. Boarding school? I said prep school, right? I I thought. I don't remember what it was. Elite yeah. prep school, elite boarding school. You'll make mm-hmm. it right, right? To an elite okay. prep school, um, mm-hmm. uh, where, um, where he gets, where he he, where he loses himself mm-hmm. a little bit in the in the culture shock, mm-hmm. in the need to where he loses where he loses himself a little in the in the culture shock, in the need to um, uh, in the need to prove himself now it's not the only thing right and loses himself in the culture shock and the need to prove himself and in uh and in his desperate desire to make good for his family yes right Mm -hmm. there i think that's it yeah 
and his desperate desire to make good for his family. Right. Because you get to tell me more later. Right. But from this, I can see, I can see what this looks like. Mm-hmm. Right. You want to give them the sense of what they're struggling against. Right. Instead of just kind of leapfrogging over that and getting to the prize. Okay. And now I can see, oh, this is juicy, right? This is, this mm-hmm. explores some things that I want to explore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you just skip over and get to the, get to the, the prizes, I, I can't see the center. Got it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Does that help? Yes, it does. Quite a bit. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Um, okay. Kathy, remind me when we're done, what time we're done here. Oh, well, the, the webinar is an hour, but we can run a little bit over. Okay. I'm going to try not to, but let me go yeah. back and share screen real fast. All right. All right. So mistakes. <laughs> here, uh, here are Laura, some mistakes. Laura, yeah. I do, we do have one other person who I believe we were playing. No, no, no. Okay. I haven't forgotten. All right. We, just making we, sure. <laughs> we're, we're good. Thank you. Okay. So. Mistakes people tend to make. We tell too much, right? We want to squeeze too many things in here. And our people, especially when people are listening to you, it's a little bit better if it's written because they can read it a second time, but they're never going to ask you to kind of repeat it unless it's me, right? But people can't absorb that much. Look at this. As opposed to, right? Just looking at this makes me feel calmer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's curated and it tells a story, right? Just, we don't try to stuff too much in. Just give the key information they need in a log line in order to be able to, to see it, to see what we're going to be grappling with, right? Where, what kind of movie is this? And then they can decide if it's up to, if it's their type of thing or not. The other thing we do is we forget about tone right? We want to include something that gives the tone of the piece. And that's what you use. That's where your refining comes in. Once you've got something down, you want to refine it with, with word choices that give you the flavor. Where, where our brains get stuck is we want, it, we want it to be, we want them to understand exactly what we're saying. We want them to understand exactly what's in our heads, right? And we make it too clinical, <laughs> we make it too much of a math equation. And what you want is just to give them the feel, right? That's so much more powerful. The other thing we forget is that no is a perfectly fine answer. No does not mean your log line doesn't work. No means your log line is working. No is fine. It's not wasting anybody's time. You, ha- you say, what are you looking for? And they tell you and that you may have that and you move on. Okay. Oh, yes. Here's what are you looking for, which we have actually covered. All right. Now we're going to television. And so then I promise you we'll have our third person who is a t- has a TV pitch for us. Okay. So with television, this is where you always get two sentences. Why? Because of scope. A feature is one story. It's like a short story. But things with a bigger scope, like TV or novels, you get two sentences because you need to give, you need just, you need that much more room to give a sense of the scope of the piece. In television, you never pitch the pilot, right? Really want you to hear me on that. You never pitch the pilot, you pitch the series. You never say, I have a TV pilot. You say, I have a TV series. Sure, you're probably going to talk about what's in the pilot at some point during the pitch. But the log line is about your main characters, what they grapple with on a weekly basis, and how it launches us into the actual series. Okay? So log lines for TV series are two sentences. Um, There you go. Or when you get to have a second sentence. And now I'm going to stop share and I'm going to work with my TV person. (laughs) Okay. So. Hi, Victoria. Hi. (laughs) Boy, am I scared. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so to give a little background on Victoria, uh, we have Victoria Augustine. She's a Barnard alum. Victoria has been recognized as a quarter finalist for the Nickel Fellowship. And regarding the TV series, she'll be workshopping. Victoria won Best Television Pilot in the 2021 Best Script Awards London. 
Okay. Um, all right, go ahead. Give me the give me your log line. So this is a limited television series called The Ballet Murders. It's a murder mystery where the billionaire patron is murdered and it becomes a scandal and it, it scandalizes Aspen's celebrated ballet company. Um, and the, te the tempestuous heiress founder battles to save her legacy. Okay, so good job throwing limited series up there first. Okay. So what you want to say is something like my um, my limited series, The Ballet Murders, is, okay, so murder mystery, luckily, you can actually get away with not saying that because it's kind of in your title. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if we take away murder mystery, what genre would this actually be? <sighs> sort of is a thriller, it, but it's... Ah, it's... that's good. A thriller is good. Why yeah. Why sort of? Why are you Because it's really a cozy murder mystery. It's a real Agatha Christie. Then, then say cozy or say Agatha Christie, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Say that. All right. Yeah. Don't use things that are wrong. That's why I like working with people want to you know, like where I can hear them and see them. It's because if it's wrong, you're going to tell me it's wrong just by your body language. Yeah. So, so thriller is wrong. So, okay. So great. So look. My limited series, The Ballet Murders, is a cozy mystery in the vein of Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. All right, that's accurate. Correct. All right, so my limited series, The Ballet Murder, is a cozy mystery in the vein of Agatha Christie. Um, uh, when, sorry, so the billionaire patron and the heiress founder, like those are both kind of, don't actually give me anything. Mm -hmm useful okay. except their money right <laughs> right 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 i i think you could say i think maybe you want to start by saying in the glittery so it's a glittery aspect is it modern day or is it is modern it a day scary piece? modern day okay um in in the glittery world of the aspen art scene right is that accurate that's correct that's correct that's fair in the glittery world of the aspen art scene and what you want to give me is not your victim but your main character Right. Okay. Right. So who is she? She is the founder and the figurehead of this ballet company. She's okay. also. Is she she's a former also, dancer? She's a failed dancer. Yes. She's a former failed dancer. Okay. She's a failed dancer. And why would she not just be staying at home sipping tea while the police investigate this? Because this is her life's work. The, the, this is the 20th anniversary of, of the company's, um, you know, um, you know, they've been around for 20 years and um, she doesn't, you know, she, she wants her and her name is on the company. Okay. None of those tell me on the inside why she's doing this. What is she searching for in her life? The failed dancer thing is the closest you've come. Yeah, um, she's 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 looking to, you know, have uh, something, you know, carry on after her death. I mean, she wants she wants a legacy. She wants, you know, she wants the she wants to be in the limelight. That is good. Right. All right. So. And what is the relationship of this patron to her? He is the chairman of the ballet board. He's also the father of um, one of her uh, dancers. Did they have a good relationship? Did she hate his guts? What was their yeah, relationship? She, no, she, she hates his guts because he's trying to take over the company. All right. That's so much more interesting than that he's a billionaire. Okay. Right? Yeah. Because what we're going to see is the struggle of she's trying to get justice for a man she loathed. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. So much juicier. So much juicier. Okay. So my limited series, The Ballet Murder, is a cozy mystery in the vein of Agatha Christie. It's set in the 
in the glittering Aspen art scene, modern day, right? I think you kind of need to say that because you've mentioned Agatha Christie and it's going to make yeah. us think the 20s, the 30s, right? Modern day. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, um, and it follows the murder of, of the chairman of the board of this ballet company. Our heroine um, is the ballet company's founder. She herself is a failed dancer and she loathed this man. <laughs> you know, she, and she hated this man, right? She would much rather be drinking champagne on his grave than helping to find his killer or the helping to bring his killer to justice, except for one thing. Her legacy is on the line. Right. And the only way for her to save her life's work is to once again, step into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. How does that sound? Uh, pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Right. So mm -hmm. it's a little long, but it's long because it's television. Okay. Right? And you do mm -hmm. want to refine it down a little bit. Yeah. 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 What did I say that was wrong? she's also um uh what is it what I, now i'm blocking i mean she uh she's also accused of his murder yeah okay that was obvious right <laughs> <laughs> but you had to tell me so i didn't put it in there but yeah, you, yeah. right so it's a, it's a limited series of the uh, agatha christie blah 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 um it's set in the glittery world of the aspen art scene um uh when a um when I, I, you know what, I would actually lose that he's German. I would just say let when, um, when a, uh, when a despicable, right, or when a loathsome um, art, pay, when a loathsome ballet patron, mm -hmm. when a loathsome patron is murdered, right, when a loathsome patron mm -hmm. is murdered, um, the the founder of the ballet company would much rather dance on his grave. Then yeah. help to find his killer, right? Better. Yes. Let's rather dance on his grave than help to find his killer. Um, except for two things. Um, uh, or it would uh, then help to find his killer. But she's suspected of the crime. Right. <laughs> but she's suspected of the crime. And even more than that, she's at risk of losing her legacy. The only way to save her, her company, the only way to save her company Yes. Right? The only way to save mm -hmm. her company is for her to once again, step into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. How's that feel? Yeah, that feels pretty good. Yep. All right. That's good. And it's a limited series. You get a couple sentences and I can see what it is. Yeah. I can see from that what the scope of the series is. Yeah. And that's good. what you're after. Good. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the sharing screen. Just if, uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to get through everything, but I may be going fairly quickly. Um, and then we can hang on for questions. Um, okay, so the tell me more part, I promised you a tell me more. So here's what happens. You give the log line and some people will say, you know, that's great. It's not my, up my alley, but I wish you well with it, right? They'll stop or they'll change the conversation entirely, right? And suddenly they'll be talking about the weather. That's fine, right? That just means they're not interested. You follow up with what are you looking for? You have a conversation about that and you move on to somebody who might be interested. Um, or they will say anything, anything that expresses interest. Literally, they will sometimes say, tell me more. Or they'll say, oh my gosh, how did you come up with that? Or are you a dancer yourself? Or, um, you know, oh, or that sounds fun, right? Whatever. And that is your invitation. Anything they say that continues the conversation, what they really mean is entertain me for 90 seconds more, right? And this is where you get to say more. So you always start by saying, well, the first thing you need to know is, now, why do you do this? You do this because your brain is going to want to answer whatever the question asked is. Structurally, that's how we're built, right? And you wanna short circuit that because it doesn't lead to the conversation you wanna have. So if you start by saying, well, the first thing you need to know is that promises you'll answer their direct question later. And you will, it's fine. And it's not, you're not trying to put one over on them. You're trying to put one over on your own brain, right? They just wanna be entertained. All right, so, well, the first thing you need to know is the single most important thing they need to hear. What does that look like? And I realize I'm going fast, but this is recorded. <laughs> um, is it based on a true story? If it is based on a true story, if it is inspired by a true story, that is absolutely the first thing they need to know. 
You always start there because they will hear everything else afterwards with a different ear. Or is it set in a world that's not here and now? That can be the 1970s, that can be the 1500s, or that could be on Mars, right? Anything that is not immediately correctly here and now. Or is there a key piece of information I need to know? Now, often this happens if it's set in a, in a world that I don't necessarily understand. Like I, my, my son, when he was in high school, was in a marching band. And it turns out that marching band has this whole series of competitions. And like, there's this whole world about competitions within high school marching bands that I knew nothing of. You might need to give that kind of context, right? That's what I mean. Is there a key piece of information? Is there something, is there some scientific thing that this is a riff on, right? Is it a riff on time travel? Is it a riff on quantum mechanics? You need to maybe give me that piece so that I can understand everything else. Um, the second thing you say is the main character and how they're dissatisfied at the start of the piece. Sometimes they're not dissatisfied. They're, they want to get back to who they were, but most of the time people are, are not super happy at the beginning of, of movies. They tend to need to go through something to get to where they, they land, right? Then you're gonna give the primary complication, the new situation that shakes up the hero or heroine's life. Pretty self-explanatory. Then their primary arc who they will need to become or what they need to do in order to earn their win. Like people need to go through something to become someone else on the other side. In television, when you're doing television, you want to show what they're going to be grappling with week to week. What is the thing or the kind of thing that we're going to see week to week? And then your connection to the material or, and or, at heart, this piece is about. So there's a reason you wrote this instead of writing anything else in the world. That is often very connected. You want to connect with people on an emotional level, right? And so either your connection to the material, it was your grandfather's story, right? It was your grandmother's story. It's your story, right? Or at heart, this is a piece about finding yourself, you know, whatever at heart this, this piece is actually about, what, what they're grappling with emotionally. And you want to end on that. You want to end on, you want this, the, the whole bit about where, where the log line is about clarity, the tell me more is about the sizzle, right? Selling the sizzle, the really good stuff. It's not about giving them a point A to point B to point C. Just give them the highlights, right? Have an ask. So if the end of your tell me more, they're like wrapped and they're like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. You should be able to say, well, it's a one pager or it's a completed script or it's a, I have a show Bible, like whatever it is, whatever you actually have, not what you'll have in a week, but what you actually have right now, you can say, well, you know, it's a, uh, it's a completed script. Would you like to take a look? Why do I say, would you like to take a look? because people hate to read. Nobody wants to read. You never say, would you like to read it? <laughs> it makes it a chore. You say, would you like to take a look? It makes it sound like they just need to take a peek at it, right? They don't actually have to read it. They just need to take a peek and maybe it's not something everybody else gets to take a look at, right? Well, it's a, whatever it is, would you like to take a look? They'll say yes, done deal. They'll say no, totally okay. What are you looking for? Or this is the most likely outcome they will counter offer. If you say, well, it's a completed script, would you like to take a look? They'll say, oh, you know, I really don't have time to look at a completed script. Do you have a one pager? You say, of course, right? And then you send it off. You should have a one pager if you have a completed script. It's a very useful piece of information to have or a piece in your portfolio to have. Okay, good news. You don't have to be great at pitching. You just have to get out there and do it. And I hope that this has made it a little bit easier for you. All right, I'm taking questions. My email address is laura at pitchingperfectly.com. Um, I told you that, uh, let me stop share, that uh, you can find the worksheet um, on my website, pitchingperfectly.com under worksheets. And I will actually pop that into the chat go for everyone. Okay, questions, Kathy. Okay, so we have a log line question. Yes. Um, someone who, 
was very eager to participate, but I know we had limited um, amount of time we, today. We barely made it through with that. I know. <laughs> um, but so this is from Daniel. Uh, he's an You're AFI welcome. alum. He just mm -hmm. was hoping you had were able to shed a little bit of light on his psychological thriller. It's called They're Watching Us. And the logline is the fourth wall crumbles when a savvy actress suspects the director of her B grade horror show is secretly recording her. Suddenly she fears her scripted murder will be the real climax of a snuff film. Okay. I like everything about it except the fourth wall crumbles. Okay. Because what that makes me think is that they're going to be talking directly to the audience. And that's a technical thing of how you do the movie and not actually whether or not I want to take a look at it, whether it's my kind of movie or not. So I would just lose that. Okay. Unless the fourth wall crumbles is the title. Is that the title? It's they're watching us is the title. Oh yeah, no. I think they're watching us. I, I would just lose that because it makes me confused enough that I kind of, I, I'm not paying attention for the next few words. That's my, you know, off the top of my head. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay. Uh, so if, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to pop them up. Laura, one thing that um, we had worked on recently was I had sent you a, you know, like a cover email of uh, just when I send the script and of uh, one project I'm working on. And you gave, you've given me funny feedback. You would, because we had worked on the log line together. So I popped that into the cover letter. And then you'd said, um, Kathy, everything you wrote was great. It's just a little bit too polite. So it's about adjusting the tone of what mm. you're saying. When yeah, you, I remember that. Can you talk about like, how do we kind of, handle making like when we send the script initially like how do we make sure we're hitting the right tone well okay so you're not actually sending i i, I you generally we, we're not sending the script without you already having a connection to the people right like we right. we don't we don't go ahead and send scripts over the transom because then people don't people aren't going to read them. Like legally, they're not going to take a look at them. That's a bad idea. <laughs> so right, this is someone who is expecting the script. Right. Yeah. So someone who's expecting it, you, I just think that you don't need to be, um, there's the, the, what you want is you want to create in the person who's going to read it, the feeling that the piece is going to create for them, right? You want to kind of create that ahead of time. So again, it's, it's about not being clinical. It's about more being you know, if it's a, if it's a thriller, you want to be just like, you want to be excited and also use words that like, I'm so excited. It's a, you know, this yours is not a thriller. That's why I'm deliberately doing something slightly different. Um, uh, you know, this is, you know, we feel it's a dark piece that will, you know, bring up the, you know, the demons in all like touch the demons. I'm totally making this up off the top of my head, but right. <laughs> something, um, uh, an edgy piece is probably uh, edgy is great word an edgy piece so it's an edgy piece that you know really speaks to the demon that lurks inside all of like I, you know i'm being a little being maybe a little too flip but you do want to like it, it's about getting out of your head about like this being right mm -hmm. and understanding it and more about creating the feeling that they're going to have when they read it because that's going to get them excited about reading it Right. If somebody hands you a book and saying you should read this or anything sort of like clinical, you're not too interested. If somebody hands you a book and says, oh, my God, it kept me up all night. Mm -hmm. Like suddenly that's at the top of your pile. Right. You just want something that you just want to you want to you want to in your in your conversation about it, create the feeling. And especially in your written you know, conversation or just be, or like literally it's like here, as we discussed, so excited for you to read this. Bye. Right. Like if they know it's coming and they know what it is, I wouldn't necessarily remind them. Right. Okay. Right? It, yes. it, you can be short and sweet, <laughs> short and sweet. Somebody asked me to pop up the, um, uh, the tell me more bit. Yes. And so I so wrote that we're recording this and everyone is going to be sent the link. Okay. To the fabulous. Okay. Fabulous. And, and so maybe we'll put it up at the very end, just for a second after. after yes. The and so another Catherine, um, Catherine with a C, not Catherine with a K like myself, um, is pointing out that, that the participants we had, for example, a lot of them have won um, some recognition at, you know, for their scripts at festivals. And she says, how can we maneuver in a world where contests are suddenly the key endorsement of your work? Let's say if you don't have- um, Enter contests. 
Exactly. But also I think. No, enter a contest. I think how you maneuver is is use it. Like it is a way in. There is no reason not to use it. It is how, it's how I got out to California. It's how I got an agent. It's like, it's how my career started. Contests are a terrific way for so many reasons. One is that when you start saying, like everybody there was a, an award winner. I used it only for the first one because it was about that particular script and, um, and it had just happened. And so uh, well, that made it good. But I, I would, I would le- like, I would have the other, um, the other two awards, the other two had won. I would put that in the tell me more for sure. People mm-hmm. listen to you differently. They listen to the piece differently. They reevaluate what they've just heard based on the fact that somebody else liked it, right? And if it won an award or you're an award-winning writer, or, you know, like that's a great thing to share. It's a great thing to share when you're networking, right? Mm-hmm. When you're sort of letting people know what you're up to. Oh, I just won this thing or, I, or that script that won the thing is now I've just done a rewrite of it. Like remind them that you're being a winning of a thing. There's very little downside to entering awards Some of them are scams. Absolutely. But even those can often give you, like even the ones that aren't really great to help you move your career forward, offer something. They offer a um, comradeship with the other people who have won. Some of them offer feedback. Like it is a terrific way in. If you're not going to enter contests, that is okay. Mm -hmm. There are other things to do. Networking is a big one, right? How, uh, joining writers groups so that other people are reading your material and getting to know you as a writer so right. that they can recommend you to and their so circles. I'm just reading and I'm I'm sorry if I hopefully I'm reading it correctly but so Catherine's saying I guess she's written for a, a, a hit tv series and she so she doesn't necessarily enter contests for screenwriting um I mean, for one thing that Laura does do is also um, help people pitch themselves just professionally. And so it's just based on your specific background and what you can use for the presentation of whatever is with your projects as well. Right. It's so not if, you're not you entering, oh. if you're not entering because you're kind of a, beyond that pay grade, mm-hmm. right? Um, well, two things. One is that I still think that, you know, if you're a professional TV writer and, you know, God bless, that's fabulous. Um, If you're a professional TV writer, you could enter a screenplay in a competition. Like I don't, there's usually competitions, there are a lot of the competitions don't care if you've been produced or not. Some of them do, but most of them don't. Um, And it's not quite your field. So you can get some really interesting feedback from it. It's like, I think that's totally fine. Um, But the, and this is, a, this is one of those things that happens in the industry, right? When you're on staff, you're so busy being on staff that you kind of nose to the grindstone. You, you just have your own little tiny world and you don't do a lot of networking outside of that. And that comes back to haunt you when you get canceled, right? Every show gets canceled. I, I, TV writers, we all need really thick skins because our contracts are in weeks. Or my contract was in weeks, right? <laughs> contracts are in weeks, not years, not even months. Um, and so you, everybody gets fired, everybody gets canceled. Like it happens all the time. What you need to do is you need to constantly be building connections with other writers on other shows. Um, there's, I I can't remember. I wish I could remember who said this. There was uh, somebody I read said, what what you really want to do is you want to gather together a bunch of peers, right? People at, at your level or your level and a little below your level right? Gather together a bunch of peers and meet on a regular basis, meet monthly and tell each other secrets, right? Like talk to each other about what's going on in the business. Talk to each other about what you're working on. Talk to each other about um, where you want to go and how you're going to get there and come up with ideas. I, I was in a mastermind group that consisted of a couple of writers, a couple of musicians, a couple of actors, like it was people from, it was 12 people deliberately chosen from all over the industry. And in that, I was in, and it was a one-year commitment to be in that mastermind. I was in that mastermind for a year. I doubled my income when I was in that mastermind because Mm -hmm. you're just, you're actively networking outside of your little world and you're learning from each other, from other points of view, right? How to do these things. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody has their own ideas and you're not just caught up in the way that all the writers you know are doing it right? An agent has a very different perspective and a composer has a completely different perspective and an actor don't even like they, everybody has their own different way of thinking of things. 
right? So, so um, network, the answer, really the answer to everything of what you want, getting what you want in life is networking. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to do it. I think, I kind of think of competitions as just like another way to, to talk about what you do. Oh, and, and if you're not winning contests, so if you're not in contests, make something, right? That's another great way. Like just make a short, make a, make a, make something on the, I, we made a web series of some friends of mine and I, we got so much work off of that. Um, we never monetized it. We really never made, we made like $500 off of it. I forget what, what we made off of it directly, but we parlayed it into work. Um, and because you just want something that you can tell people about. You just want a project. You just want something that you can tell people about that's ideally something they can, they can see that gives you a stamp in another in a slightly different way. I hope that's useful. Right. Um, I feel like that also answered this other question about um, this person, uh, Jackson, has um, placed in competitions, but it hasn't resulted in getting a manager and agent. And do you have any insights there? So I feel yeah, like it's really hard to get a manager and an agent. <laughs> or it's really hard to get an agent. Plus, it's slightly less hard to get a manager. But even that's kind of crazy hard these days. Look, right. The best thing to do. All right. So, um, one thing to do right? What you're doing is great. And, and winning competitions is actually super useful. You have to actually make hay with that, right? So when you win the competition, you actually need to like, let everybody know that you've won that competition. And by everybody, I mean, your list of managers that you're really interested in that you're just, you're, you're cultivating them, right? You just drop them a postcard. Hey, just want to let you know I won this competition. You send them an email. Hey, just want, like postcards are the way we used to do it. <laughs> Free internet. But they probably don't get as, that much real mail anymore. It would probably stand out more. Or, you know, you can send an email. You can um, just sort of keep them on board. But also you want to let your, your network know that, like, all of your friends, oh, hey, I just want, and we think of that as bragging. It's not bragging. It's sharing good news. Mm -hmm. Right? It's sharing good news. You want to invite people to be happy for you. Um, and And then... The, really, so the best way to get representation is to get work. You're going to get your own work anyway. It's just myth that a rep gets you work. A rep is is someone who opens up their Rolodex to you, right? They they help you get out there, but you're you're the one going in. You're the one doing the writing. You're the one getting your own work. How can you make something actually happen? How can you get a you know? How can you get work? And then then you just call somebody up and say, hey, I you know I have this thing. I need someone to do the deal. Can we talk? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a final question that I think we're going to wrap up, Laura. But um, what ha I know that uh, sometimes when you're pitching, you have to kind of retool your log line, let's say, and let's mm -hmm. say there's a competing project um, to your log line. And so you've retooled your log line. And I think we talked about this, which you had said, nothing you can say is going to change someone's mind who's not into making that specific type of movie. Is there that ever is so a time, true. but like, do you ever, is there ever a time to, to, to like defensively think of maybe what some people might ask you about your project ahead of time? Or is that? Oh, something? absolutely. Okay. There are questions that you're always going to get for a television show. The big thing is legs. Does it have legs? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. how is this going to actually last a number? That is, you absolutely should think that through. Absolutely. But right. that's not in the log line, mm -hmm. right? Like that's in a fuller pitch. So um, the, the, the thing is your, your project is what it is. That's not saying it can't be better, mm -hmm. right? If, if, you're, if you are pitching a TV series and it really doesn't have legs, that's not useful to you. I think what we're, we're talking about two different things. So what you're asking me is how can you change your log line when there's a competing project as opposed to. I mean, not really. I guess I was just saying what we had been talking about that on something. Right. Then, well, so if, yeah. if mm -hmm. look, if, if I actually remember this with the truth about cats and dogs. Okay. Right. So the truth about cats and dogs, when they went out with the pitch for it, um, she hadn't finished writing it yet, she, but she was pitching it. And then she heard that somebody else had bought and, you know, had bought a, a similar story. Let's put mm -hmm. it this way, a similar story. And, um, and, and so she just stopped writing. Right. And this actually mm -hmm. might not have been, this was something around that time with a similar thing to it. And, and she, and then it fell through 
And so she finished writing. Like, <laughs> right. I'm saying like, maybe don't actually have your, like, I'm saying write it anyway. Like just okay. write it because you never know what's going to fall through. You never know, you know, like sometimes something's in the zeitgeist and there can be more than one movie version of it, right? Mm-hmm. While you were sleeping came out at the same time as Mrs. Winterborn. Right? And mm-hmm. Mrs. Winterborn sued while you were sleeping and lost because they said it was, it was too close. Right? No, it was just the same story, but better done, right? <laughs> much more <laughs> charming, much sweeter. Right. Mm-hmm. You can't just not do your project because somebody else is or there's only five stories in the world that we just keep writing over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So right? you're saying so, like if you're working on a let's say modern Romeo and Juliet and you hear that someone else, he, you know, someone else here is doing a modern Romeo and Juliet. Just drill down into what makes your special. Right. Drill so down just into, like, highlighting like, that highlight rather that. than you are rather than having it. to work yourself yeah. in a pretzel about. I already know about this competing project and this is why mine is different. So it's, it's not even paying attention to that. Just saying, this is why mine is what, this is why mine is worth making unique. Yeah. Right. This okay. is mine. And, and it's always true that yours is different. It's always right. true because you're different. Mm-hmm. What you bring to the table, that's always going to be the secret sauce. Right. So yeah, drill down on that. Okay. I love that. Well, Laura, I've said this every time, every time I see you do someone's log line, it is absolutely magical and it blows my mind. Um, and when you did Victoria's, when you brought the ballet into dancing on the grave, I mean, the things you come up with are just incredible. And I, what I love is you do the log line and then the writer goes, oh, my script is about that actually, but I didn't even realize how it sounded distilled down. Um, so thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. My pleasure. Um, and so I hope everyone enjoyed today's workshop. We have, Q will have um, a couple other upcoming events, which we're very excited about. And we look forward to hopefully connecting with more of you in the future. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm so glad I could, could introduce you to everybody.